Hi everyone. Today I'll be discussing the abiotic and biotic factors that have allowed cartilaginous fishes to persist throughout time for as long as they have. A little about me, my name is Kayla and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington. And I'm primarily based out of the Friday Harbor Labs on San Juan Island. I get to study cartilaginous fishes. I've been lucky enough to observe them um, while they swim and live in their natural habitats during dives and even during a submersible dive during my research career. So let's start with a little bit of background and address the question, who are the cartilaginous fishes? The chimeras, sharks, skates, and rays make up the class chondrichthys. They're an assemblage of fishes that have been around for over 400 million years. And this long evolutionary history has led them to exhibit many different life history traits in addition to various body plans as we can see here. And this translates into many continuums of swimming mode, thereby allowing them to inhabit many different habitats. And because of this, they exhibit a wide range in ecologies and biogeography as they're found throughout the world's aquatic systems all the way from the shallows to the depths of over 3000 meters. So being that these fishes have thrived for hundreds of millions of years in varying environments, it might come as no surprise that they are widely geographically distributed. And here we can see some of the hot spots and some of the bodies of waters um, that do exhibit higher amounts of species richness than others. And these are primarily the West Pacific Ocean. So we know where they are globally. But another primary driver of spatial distributions and habitat structuring, specifically of fishes, is the depth at which they live. So life in the photic zone or upper regions offers considerably um, more and different prey options in addition to more light. And once you get past this 200 meter mark or into the mesopelagic, there's little to no light and even further past that into past a thousand meters or the BV pelagic, there's an ever increasing force of pressure and decreasing amount of oxygen. So there's clearly multiple physiological restraints that could be driving the distributions of species richness that we're seeing um, by depth. So I set out to determine which factors or life history traits are attributed to life across these different different depth zones. And how I did this was to compile the results or data sets of many other studies into one metadata set. Um, this is comprised of roughly 1100 species, which includes their geographical and depth distributions, in addition to their maximum body size, which is in total length or wingspan, their reproductive modes and their locomotive modes. So these are the three main parameters for building our ecospace. The body sizes range from under a foot long to the size of a school bus, which would be the well-known whale shark. And the group, this group as a whole, chondrichthys as a whole, features various continuums of swimming modes from full body undulations to multiple modes of modified pectoral fin swimming and even walking in some sharks. For reproductive modes, chondrichthys are amongst the most diverse of all vertebrates, where some species deposit their embryos into egg capsules, which develop independently on the seafloor, and other sharks maximize their maternal investment to the level of placental. So here's what we get when, we, when the metadata set is visualized into a 3D projection of ecospace. And this ecospace occupation of chondrichthys, this is the ecospace occupation of chondrichthys across all of those different depth zones that we were looking at previously with body size, reproductive mode and locomotive mode serving as the three main axes of this ecospace. On the left, we have the different levels uh, which follow the various modes of locomotion and a representative taxon to visualize the difference in body shapes and the symbol next to that indicates the different categories of chondrichthys, which are two groups of sharks, the chimeras, the skates, and the rays, which are plotted on our ecospace. 
So now focusing on the eco space, now that we know what everything is, we can see that some, um, or we can see that sharks in general come in all of the body sizes and exhibit all reproductive modes as they cover this whole entire bottom region of the eco space. And to contrast, batoids, or the skates and rays, are more diverse in swimming style, but more constrained when it comes to reproductive modes. And even more yet are the chimeras, which are constrained to only a few options on all three axes. So our theoretical ecospace is made up of 189 ecocells. And what we see are that there's only 39 symbols or 39 eco cells filled, which means that roughly 23% of chondrichthian life history traits are pretty constrained um, for the potential space that they could occupy. If we focus on the deepest zones of the deepest zones eco space, we see three different groups, which all have different modes of swimming, but similar body sizes in that we see all of the 21 species that inhabit, that solely inhabit the baby pelagic, or they're just restricted to those um, deep, the deepest zone. They're all under three meters, so they're small in size, and they all lay eggs as their mode of reproduction. So while they all lay eggs, their egg cases um, all take on different morphologies, and they have a, but they have a similar function of having to persist in the depths long enough to be able to hatch and then the embryos becoming fully, fully self-sufficient um, young of the year or small, small individuals. So here, if we continue to visualize the relationships between reproductive modes and specific depth zones for which those species are found, we again see that in the baby pelagic, or from 1,000 to 4,000 meters, there are only egg-laying species. And before I go into the other relationships, I'll first orient you into what all of these bars mean. So each bar represents the reproductive mode or modes found within a specific depth category. And the, le the length of each band is the percentage of species that exhibit that specific reproductive mode highlighted and colored on the right and the left side. And finally, the total bar length indicates how many meters each depth range is. So we see that while chondrichthys are extremely diverse in having evolved at least seven different reproductive modes, the top photic zones, or specifically the zone on the right, where species are known to travel throughout all zones, we see almost all of the reproductive modes present. And again, if we look at the baby pelagic, we know and see that there's only one reproductive mode utilized and that is egg laying. So these data reflect physiological restraints of reproductive modes across different depths for cartilaginous species that are living and swimming around today. While we see the reproductive modes are highly correlated with depth, more so as a function of physiological constraints of life at depth, and also various trade-offs in maternal investment in general, we also see a strong phylogenetic signal across the class as a whole, where one modern clade of sharks has high reproductive plasticity and maternal investment, where they exhibit all seven reproductive modes. And the other clade of sharks has continued with using um, yolk-only investment well, we see that batoids or the skates and rays are egg layers or give, give live birth, but they do so with lower levels of maternal investment compared to a shark that is placental. So we can also see the reproductive modes have maintained pretty consistent in most clades of modern chondrichthys, but here the basal nodes reflect um, more of what researchers find in the fossil records. So that would be that there were at one point many more viviparous or live bearing reproductive modes present in extinct taxa that would now belong to an only egg laying clade today. And this is seen in such things as the chimeras specifically. So we find 
um, that we find that this phylogenetic reconstruction of chondrichthyan reproduction aligns more with the paleontological record. And this allows us to reinterpret the evolution of vertebrate, vertebrate reproduction um, modes as a whole and cartilaginous fish communities in deep time. So again, to wrap up, we see that there's a strong relationship between the extant life of um, species living in the deep sea and reproductive mode, again, physio physiologically driven. And we have a higher species richness and modes of reproduction um, displayed in, a, in the upper aquatic zones compared to life in the depths. And then finally, the extant chondrichthyan uh, ecospaces are correlated more to aquatic depth than geographical location globally. And I'd like to thank my funding sources for supporting this work and the people who have helped me along the way. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks.